Good now, everyone out there in the betaverse. How indeed are you at this moment? I'm Ryan Erickson with Red42, and I am here with a wonderful and slightly provocative, might I say, guest um, with us today. And my normal and usual normal is is it good to say normal for 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 Niels? I don't know, Niels. No. Uh, my guest Niels Flaging here, and our guest. So, which I think our provocative guest Todd Bridgman in the middle of the screen. All right, Niels, hey. you look you're you're looking a little pixelated. Do you feel okay? <laughs> uh, are you there? Wonderful. He was going so well in the lead up, wasn't he? It, it was. I, it I was had the awesome. problems. It was awesome in the lead up. Let me let me see if we got this here. So, those of you who are out there are seeing our our technical challenges here um all right um and niels is still frozen so um i'm gonna i'm gonna drop him out and then we'll go with uh, a couple questions that i had niels and i talked a little bit in our pre-show about what we're going to approach with you and i think this also may be a good time um, for you to give a few words about who you are dr todd bridgman and what is your purpose in in the world and life and management theory in general thanks ryan and nice to be here and thanks very much for the invitation so yeah i'm todd bridgman i'm a professor of management studies here at victoria university in wellington uh, in new zealand and um, i've been an academic for most of my life started as a journalist actually and we might talk about the ways in which my kind of journalism background has informed the way i do my research what am i about I, I guess if I was to summarize it in a short way, it's I'm, I'm trying to challenge the way that management is taught to students. So my research is at the intersection of uh, management education, management history, and this field called critical management studies. And I'm very interested in how we teach management and um, have been quite critical of the ways that we teach management. And so kind of dedicated my, uh, my career, I suppose, to try and to change the way that management is taught because I have this belief that um, the way that management is taught has an influence over the way that management is practiced. So, you know, in the business school, we get hundreds of students. Welcome back, Niels. Uh, we get hundreds of students coming through every year. And, and in a way, I think their, their business education or management education in particular is socializing them into their expectations of um, how they should manage if they get into management roles, but also probably importantly, how they uh, will be managed. And and we can talk about it. I don't think a lot of that socialization is particularly um, healthy or functional either for individuals or for organizations or society. So yeah, that's really what I'm interested in, I guess, how we, how we teach management to students with the hope that over time, you know, if we teach management differently, uh, we might be able to kind of do management differently, I guess. Hmm. Uh, a bold and um, honorable hope for sure. Welcome to the stream, Niels. Would you like to say a, a moment about you and how you encountered Todd and maybe we flow into the questions? Yes. And uh, by the way, I wanted to show you uh, some of your books, Todd, if you don't mind. Uh, to, to very, you're very good. I've been very uh, impressed when I've, I've watched your previous shows, the way you do this. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I, a very I, big, I do not quite bookshelf. Think yeah yeah yeah. i have one i have one this in this one is weighing heavily on my bookshelf right it's what a was that? volume uh that was published in 2009 so my i was very fortunate actually to um to have you will not as my phd yeah. supervisor yeah yes yeah he is who, a, who he's, was your he's PhD a, uh hugh Wilmot. so together with uh hugh and matt salverson a kind of regarded, I guess, as one of the founders of critical management studies, this, this subgroup within the field of management studies. And I was fortunate enough to be Hugh's PhD student at the University of Cambridge. And um, yeah, luckily, actually, I, uh, they invited me onto, onto that project. So yeah, that was that's a while ago now, 15 years ago. So you lived, you lived in England at the time? I did. So I'm from New Zealand, but moved to England with my wife to, to do the PhD with Hugh. And yeah, ended up having one child there and then three more when we came back to New Zealand. So came back to Wellington and been here at Victoria for 
for 50, uh, no, 18 years. Wow, time flies. Um, and if I get that right, critical management studies, I met, I, I do not know exactly how it feels to be in, the, in that field officially. I kind of feel sy sympathetic and associated with it, of course, but as a non-academic, yeah. I imagine that's like a, the minority report of business studies. Yeah, it's interesting. I was listening to your discussion with Ron Purser and, and he was saying about it, you know, he found it later in his career and he was saying that he felt quite marginal within the business school. But um, I mean, critical management studies originated in um, in kind of Scandinavia with Mats and in the UK with Hugh and others. And, and we're fortunate here in New Zealand, a number of us have been educated in those in those systems. And we're fortunate maybe because of the way our universities are funded here, but it's it's kind of a welcome home for critical management scholars here in New Zealand. So we have a number um, within our school here in uh, Victoria and Wellington. So I don't feel I need to hide it or um, I don't feel marginal down here. But yes, I guess if you position critical man management studies within the whole field of management studies, yeah. it would be marginal. So we kind of talk about elite. critical it's versus a... the mainstream, but um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And you went on to do more like that. I, I think I would I would say all your work is in that field, right? You, you you say yourself that it's at the intersection, I think, of management education. How do you management call it? History, history, management history, and critical management studies. And I only really stumbled into the the current interest in textbooks and uh, with my colleague here, Steve Cummings. And you know, we started that I guess about fifteen years ago. Um, but initially, when I wrote that book with Hugh and did the PhD, I was wandering around, not really knowing where to focus my interest. But I'd always had this passion for teaching and um, eventually figured out that I could combine with my passion for teaching with research into how we teach management. And yeah, that's been a really nice coming together of the two major you know, foci of academic labor, uh, teaching and research. So, you know, a lot of my good ideas for research have come through my teaching and um the research has really energized my teaching and so um yeah that's been a really a nice combination yeah can can we ask you a little bit about how would you describe your is your teaching different than than the usual as well um I, it probably is a little bit different i don't i wouldn't certainly claim it to be unique i mean it has there are lots of people in my field i think doing teaching in this way but a lot of my research has challenged the representation of foundation, foundational theories of management in textbooks. Mm -hmm. um, and so I used to teach with a, a large textbook, actually a book that Hugh Wilmot edited, um, but now I use my own book, which is this very short, reasonably cheap, uh, what is it? Oh, it's got a very, very short, fairly interesting and reasonably cheap I'm book glad about organisation. Who this, couldn't rip that this off? This is the long one. This is a, a, yeah. another one from the series, yes. That's right, yeah, so it's a Sage series. So I, up, I, I have, um, it's got a lot of post-it notes you can see, I've read it well and um, helped write it with Steve. Um, but I, and it's tiny, you know, you can read it probably in a couple of hours. Yes. And I, you know, I, I use this as my textbook. So for my uh -huh. second year undergraduate class in organization behavior, okay. 270 students and you know, the, the textbook market is interesting. Students are increasingly reluctant to buy textbooks and to read them. And so what I decided to do, I wanted to, well, I kind of wrote this book partly around the way I taught the course for many years. And so I want students to actually read this book. And I think it's, you know, it's cheap and it's short. So hopefully they do. Um, but use this as a starting point to, um, to explore their own ideas about management. So I'm, I mean, I could go on for so long about this, but... Um, Please do so. <laughs> well, it kind of goes back to when I was a student and I I came to university with a set of expectations that I felt weren't matched. Um, I'd left school, been to Polytech, worked as a journalist for a couple of years, very much interested in this idea of the media as the fourth estate, uh, who kind of holds those in authority or account, who contributes to... Um, a democratic society. So I was quite an idealist, I guess. And I went to university expecting that I would be exposed to a whole range of different ideas yes. and perspectives and, no and worldviews and, and, and that I would be able to um, make up my own kind of judgments on those. And actually, if you look at the specific legislation in New Zealand, the Education Act that gives universities the, 
the right to confer degrees and to charge fees. It expressly says that the distinctive mission of the university or the requirement compared to other um, institutions in the high, tertiary higher education sector here is to cultivate intellectual independence. Yeah. And I interpreted that as to expose students to a wide, wide range of ideas, different ways of thinking about the world, encourage them to think critically and creatively, but importantly, to let them form their own judgments. And I studied in a business school as well as in the political science faculty. And I felt in both faculties, I was very strongly socialized. Um, I was being effectively, I thought, told what to think rather than um, learning about how to think and and kind of finding my own way. And yeah, I, I thought that wasn't that wasn't the purpose of the university. And so I've tried to include that in my teaching. So I don't want students just to give back what I give them in this textbook. This is just really a starting point. I'm asking them to, to in, in their assessment, to engage in this, take an idea from this book, but then to build on it. So I'm yeah. expecting them to uh, do a little bit of research, reading around whatever interests them to it. So allow them some agency to choose what they're interested in, just to set them off in the path, but for them to come back and to um, explore the field for themselves, but also to think what I call kind of reflexively or criti critical reflexivity, which is to think of, to make their learning personal, um, to, to question their own assumptions about what they might have thought about management um, and to, to think personally so they can hopefully develop their thinking. So all the assessment really is around a learning journal. So it's a really different approach to education that I had when I was studying these same subjects because it felt like I just needed to learn the material and give that back to um, my course instructors and I would get a good grade. And the problem was that I didn't like what I was being given back then. I thought it was socializing me into this kind of really, in the business school, this really quite narrow ideological view about what capitalism was or should be, what organizations should be about, what management is, um, our expectations of how we would manage and importantly, our expectations of how we would be managed. And I thought that's that's really kind of constraining and yeah, not 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 living up to the potential of a university. Hmm. I I have to add this comment here because I think it, it came from one of our viewers, uh, Dr. Dave Fearon. Um, you're talking about the mainstream of management as the, as the mainstream run down to a trickle, right? Yeah, that's that's interesting. So what is that? The, the idea that the mainstream is is kind of running out of steam or new ideas and things. I mean, it's oh. interesting. You know, like I would say. Yeah. And relevance, yeah, it's because you know, in critical management studies, only these are only two categories, but often I've introduced students. There's kind of the mainstream of management, which is the way management is typically thought and researched about, and that's prioritizing values of you know profit maximization, productivity, and efficiency. And and then there's kind of this critical view, which is saying different values are important, uh, you know, uh, justice and autonomy or freedom or uh, um, whatever it, whatever it is, and you know, over time, you see how, because these categories are, are fluid, how those some of those ideas find their way into mainstream thinking, and so mainstream thinking shifts. So, yeah, I mean, it's I mean, mainstream thinking I'd still say is really very influential, but there is a debate certainly about where are the new ideas in management, and that's where, you know, often you look to the margins for new ideas, and not just for people to doing academic research, but you know, people such as yourself out there doing it in organizations, in practice, and yeah, often that's where I think the new ideas are more likely to be found. I mean, we, but we are also great admirers of your historical work. I mean, it's it's in your in your little book. Let's say it, there yeah, are so many that's easier. themes. Before before we started talking, um, uh, Ryan mentioned that there is a chapter about Marx and his role. Uh, apparently, yeah. in the book. I I I, wrote, I read your book that book uh, a couple of years ago, so I do not remember all the chapters, but they were all quite provocative. And I might mention that the articles that you have been uh, producing over the last uh, few years, especially with um, Stephen Cummings, but also with other authors, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, one that has been very influential on me personally was uh, your debunking of uh, the the Kurt Levine. Uh, yeah. Uh, unfreeze, change, freeze, myth, 
Fantastic paper. I mean, that that was read millions of times. So you are kind of a today on on social media. I wanted to write something like you are the Dua Lipa of uh, critical things, <laughs> or, or together with Stephen, you might be Daft Punk. Or so very, very, you're very successful. I think uh, very well. Really it's well it's. Read. I would say it's more like you know. I used to think about when I was growing up listening to music. You had these bands that were called one hit wonders. You know, like they yes. had one. Uh, one song or album that just took off and then they re reproduced another one and it just <laughs> didn't happen and so actually sometimes i think our, my career is a little bit like that because yeah that oh. lewin paper and it was through a, a weird concept that, that was a bit of luck but that just you know this concept of viral and in, in academic terms it actually was it just went viral it just had an audience that we could never have dreamed of and you know there's a momentum to those things and you know some of the papers we've written since have had a big following particularly the, the paper on maslow and his his pyramid that he didn't create but you know yeah. some of our new papers they have a, a much much smaller reader, readership so yeah it's interesting how you know some ideas take off and then they get a, a life of their own eh? but yeah in terms of reads that one for an academic paper has been phenomenal I think it, it was, yes. it's been potentially one of the most read papers in management studies, according to the, the download count on the human relations website. So we, so we got lucky that, there. What did that paper do to your uh, reputation in management or business studies circles? Um, I think it, it just created a space for us to be able to do work of a similar nature. So that's, I mean, you know, I was stumbling around, as I said, looking for for something to research and I did this project with Steve and and all it did I guess is it created a space for us to say yeah that we can continue with this line of work so we're not Lewin experts we just skim across the surface of a lot of different foundational theories but what we're interested in doing basically is looking at how the theory is represented in management textbooks so how it's taught to students yes. and how it's done in practice now most of these theorists like Kurt Levine uh, we're not management theorists. He was a social psychologist, or you could say child psychologist. Uh, so, you know, management studies is a very young field. We have got our foundational theories from other more established academic disciplines. Yes. So what we basically do is look at how the theory is represented in management textbooks primarily. Then we go back and read the original work. And, you know, often you see, everything is different. Well, a lot is different. <laughs> And, and I guess that's to be expected because you're taking often complex bodies of work and reducing it to like textbooks, which are simplified, broad down versions. But what's really fascinating for me is having done a number of these authors, you know, Levine and Maslow and scientific management and, uh, you know, uh, recently, well, Milgram. And there there is a common pattern in terms of the misrepresentation. And that comes back to my initial comment to Ryan, I think maybe before you joined Niels was that kind of concluded that what we what we learn or what is we're teaching students in management typically in these large um, mainstream popular largely American textbooks is the ideas of these famous theorists kind of filtered through what Stephen Robbins who was the world's leading textbook author in management calls business school values which are basically a set of ideological values about capitalism the importance of productivity profit efficiency the right of management to manage and to call the shots in organizations alpha i guess what you would call it and um so yeah the work of these foundational theorists is kind of twisted misrepresented and filtered through these business school values and then presented to students as scientific truth effectively and and um yeah, I just, I, that, that still makes me angry, actually, just talking about it. I, I just think that does a massive disservice to students, but also to organisations, I think, as you probably believe as well, that we could do organising so much better, um, yeah. better in ways that is genuinely empowering for employees, more successful for organisations. If we if we just thought about management or managing in a, in a different way, and so often it's trying to recover from these misrepresented theories these kinds of you know if these these pearls of wisdom if you like that we could we could think again about these theorists in ways that we could make organizations much better yeah i think uh ryan i'm sorry if i'm so anxious to talk to uh, to todd finally <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been a while 
I, I, when I read the last paper, I, one of the last papers you published, uh, the one about Burns and mm. the concept of yeah. transactional leadership and transformative leadership, which is complete bogus, of course, in a way. But you go back yeah. to the sources, identify that Mr. Burns wrote a book for a totally different kind of topic and clientele, that it, this, mm. these ideas were appropriated by management studies. Yeah, and I, then, I don't think you'd like that paper because, you know, having exactly. read your stuff, you're, 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 I, you're I much like more ending. radical. You're, you're much more radical, right? So I think you're saying, well, should I explain that paper just briefly? Like the, the lesson coming yes, out of Yes, please do so. By the way, I liked it. I just do not like the ending. We can go into that briefly if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please explain. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant yeah. paper. Right? Again, another smash hit, I would say. Please go. Ahead. I don't know. This one was done with a, a master's student, Lauren Eaton, and she's the first author on a paper. And that's been another really fit, such a rewarding part of my career is to, to through my teaching, kind of capture the minds of some interested students, undergraduate students, and then they come in and they they start doing this research with Steve and I, and and to have that published. Lauren published that, and now she's doing a PhD in Copenhagen. And yeah, that's that's a really cool part of it. But anyway, it's transformational leadership within business studies and management studies in particular. It's it's the most influential theory of leadership. It's as understood within a business school. Transformational leaders are these heroic, charismatic figures that you know can see the future and have these visions for organisations that others in the organisation can't see. And so, you know, they kind of articulate these visions and it's kind of pushed down through the organization Ho hopefully the followers kind of you know engage and be motivated and following the leader there and um you know it's, it's influential theory and I've, I've been really critical of it in practice because i'm very concerned in organizations and you know one organization i've been part of i i, I have experienced this where there's a real lack of accountability for these so-called transformational leaders they are kind of elevated into these positions and it's almost like the the keys to the organization is or the car is handed over to this person to enact their grand vision and often there's you know if they're new to the organization they don't really understand the organization very well often i don't think they're very interested in sticking around for long because you know the career of a transformational leader is to move from organization to organization transforming them and so yes. often organizations i think are, are kind of used or walked over by these people so i've been yes. concerned about that um but actually yes going back to where that theory comes from it was James McGregor Burns, who was right, he was a political scientist, historian. He's writing about American politics and American yeah. presidents. I, I had so, no clue about that. I had yeah, so he's gotten back to the I, original. I, I, I had a vague idea, but going back to read it, you know, he's he's saying the moral legitimacy. So what he was annoyed at was this pork barrel politics. Basically, politicians in America buying votes with promises of of industry subsidies or new infrastructure for local communities. And, and he says, can't we do something a bit more meaningful? Can't these prospective leaders articulate the, their visions for America, put those in front of voters, and then voters will choose the leader. And then at the next election cycle, those leaders will be held accountable for their visions and their promises by the voters. So the essence of transformational leadership is democratic it's the <laughs> burn says the moral legitimacy of transformational leaders is the fact that they are chosen by followers now yeah. I, I mean all our work steve and i and others we're interested in how and how that idea from enough another field comes into management studies and it happens in the 80s and american writers bernard bass particularly they take the idea of heroic transformational figure who can articulate the vision but they leave behind completely the democratic foundation, the fact that these leaders are elected by followers and, and held made accountable by them. And so that's that's the problem for me. And this is um, an, an interesting thread that I have encountered in your work overall with Stephen Cummings, uh, that you, that's my feeling at least, uh, the theme for the thread for me that you, you hit this note on and on in your work that all these great great concepts they become depoliticized by the management caste and then repoliticized mm -hmm. in order to sustain command and control authoritarianism paternalism 
right? And I think you yeah. have been hitting this yeah. uh, over and over again in your work in this book as well. Uh, yeah. In all yeah, your papers. Uh, it's called yeah. alpha washing, Niels. That's, that's alpha yeah. washing. In a way, and, it and, is. And what grates me further with it is that it's these, it's often presented as factual scientific objective. You know, so this veneer of science that provides legitimacy for these political ways of thinking. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, the way I think ideas are political, you know, I'm, I'm overtly talking about politics when I'm writing this book and teaching my students, but I don't want, well, one, I want to put those ideas up for debate rather than presenting them as truthful, but I'm also not tied to my, I don't want my students, I don't want to brainwash or socialize my students into my worldview, because that's exactly what I dislike from my university lecturers. So it's it's a hard thing to do, but I'm kind of putting these provocative ideas out there. But I, I don't want to judge them on where they end up in terms of the, their idea. It's it's all about can they think about their ideas and can they art articulate the reasons behind their thinking rather than saying that's that's a good idea and that's a bad idea. So yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a diversion from your question, but, it's but yeah, it, it's 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 politics hidden beneath this veneer of science. I think a lot yeah, of a lot of what it is. And yeah. Yeah. hey, can we, can we just come back to your view, Niels, on the on the paper? Because I because when I read your stuff, because I think so. I, in that paper on transformational leadership, we kind of say we should be debating the point that we live in a democracy. We value living in a democracy very highly, but when we go to work most of us are working in some form of dictatorship. So let's have a debate about when we're at work, this idea that that employees elect their bosses. But I think that's, so that's kind of where we finish. But, but reading your stuff, I think you would say, would you, that we're, that's still within this alpha world because we've still yes. got the hierarchies. Electing bosses, electing bosses is like uh, wanting, trying to establish transformational leaders, some of them. And, and this is touched upon in your in this paper that we're discussing about Burns. Um, it's it's a it's a, the title. It bears the title about it's about democracy in the workplace. Right? Workplace de democracy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then at the end, it falls short of its own claim. I think in that there is a comment, a paragraph that I'm sure you didn't write yourself. Probably your your student. I don't know. I don't know. Wrote that. Don't say. Oh, oh, one might question if. The distinction between leaders and followers is still valid, or should should be should be promoted, or should be perpetuated. But most organizations are not there yet. That's one of the paragraphs at, towards the end in the last chapter. Yeah. Says that. I guess I guess we're kind of arguing that we might like the revolution, but this is part of the reform. So we are we reformist in saying, well, you know, this would be incrementally better than what we have, where we have these unaccountable leaders to at least have a, leaders with more accountability, but. I get the sense that you you're either advocating or enacting something much more radical, are you, in terms of what democracy so. no. means? Yeah, interesting, interesting. Thank you for 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 mentioning that. No, I think and, and I think you a misperception of democracy in organizations would be to establish voting, voting bosses, voting leaders. That is mm. not at all what we would promote, right? I think is on the same. We're on the, probably on the same page on that on that one. Well, we were promoting yeah. democratization. Well, it, opens, it opens you up to groupthink. It opens you up to the social influence uh, piece of it, and the kind of the nefarious underside of of that uh, the the voting apparatus. So, I mean, there's yeah. Again, one thing: what is the source of authority? Is the source of authority only the influence that you have with others, or is the source of authority? Um, your mastery in a domain and your your recognition of the mastery of others. Or, you know, or is it just the positional point, positional that you have? So that 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 I think is is a is part of it because we're just voting you into a position, and we have mm. and this kind of social well, dynamic. I, I personally, I would argue that voting is not at all what we should look for in organizations. We should look for decentralization. Yeah, because if you decentralize decision making to teams in the periphery, small teams. Yep. Yeah. that have have to be self-organized uh yeah. then you have implicit you have democracy and then yeah. top managers executives will have to serve the periphery 
which would run the business. I mean, we. we I we, went we, um, after your conversation with Ron. I went out uh, and got this book, and yeah, so that's all there. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I guess it's just I thought about democracy and organisations in a different way, I suppose. But yes, I can see how our thinking was was limited by that. So yeah, these discussions are good because then yeah. I'm we think here. a critical, a critical. I mean, this this might be something for a next edition of your book here. Uh, mm. uh, well, we I have a next edition actually. We've just we're hopefully about to to get the contract for the second edition. So yeah, mm. I I was meaning to get in touch with you about Follett and things because the way we talk about Follett in that book is not in the first edition is is not good enough. So yeah, we can have some further conversations ah, about yeah. that. Yeah, I was time. wrong about Follett totally at the beginning too I, I, I mean still we might still all be wrong right but we, we're, we're slowly figuring out i think what what the role of follett was I, I think. Well, yeah I, we probably don't do justice to her ideas we say she you know was this kind of forgotten figure and and talk about that why she might have been neglected problem. but we but we don't really then do enough with what she what they're thinking and what the implications are for today yeah yeah. But but uh, back back to but just a second. That's a pitch that I want to do. I never do pitches, but I, I will try to pitch something to you in a very American fashion. <laughs> I think the there's a critical distinction to be made to think productively about organizational democracy, and without that distinction to words, uh, we cannot think constructively about democracy in the workplace. Uh, workplace because organizations are not like societies; they are just different. So I believe that the distinction. Uh, of course, Ryan knows, knows this very well, this distinction, is that between periphery and center. If you do not have that for an organization, if you do not use that, and that the periphery must be in charge, not the center, that the periphery mm. needs to steer the center instead of the center steering through command and control the periphery, because the periphery can then be steered by the marketplace. This idea, I think it's essential, really, uh, very close mm. to this complexity topic that, that we have been. So it's democracy and is, is it kind of self-managing? Is that or self? How it so is not it is an enterprise. It's... Yeah, no self managing, no democracy. Sure, and then periphery being in charge, running business, many small business in the periphery, and they steer the center. That and the 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 idea, of course, of having this periphery, these periphery teams in the um, these periphery teams, if they own the money, then it tot creates a totally different relationship. Uh, uh, it, <laughs> let's say it creates a real market economy. It's the gold rule of organizations, right? If, if the periphery has the gold, they purchase services from from the center and then then throughout, and, exactly. and that that the that the flow is not top down. The flow is, you know. And then, of course, these periphery cells they cannot do everything alone. They need to agree on certain things so that the whole organization can do it. They need to. A line, mm. that's a command control word, I would say, but they can agree on things. They can create joint consciousness and uh, uh, consultation. So, so yeah, this, the secret is in combining self-organization and decentralization and power in the periphery with them owning mm. money and being responsible for business. All these concepts and, and to eliminate the notion of leaders and followers is a byproduct yeah. of that. I would say so yeah. burns paper really fascinated me in that i wanted to agree but i had to disagree with parts of them yeah of it. yeah I can, see, I can i can see a bit more from why why you would do that yeah no, that's helpful thanks but the, your work is so fantastic it makes us think i think this book also blew my mind uh, all, uh, hmm. your, your little book here blew my mind and there's also this one i think we haven't yeah that one yet. yeah yeah so that's that kind of comes from and this this got us into trouble, I guess, with established management historians. So I've <laughs> never studied I've never studied history at school or university, and um, and we wrote a book with a provocative title, "A New History of Management," and yes. um, that's kind of challenging what we argue is a very linear monocultural history of management. So we analysed lots of management history articles, and most of them are about American or British organizations at the start of the 20th century. That's where our understanding of what management is has largely come from. And we are basically arguing that um, if we go to different places, look at different places and at different times, we could um, get a, a new history of management or a very different way of thinking about management. And, um, and um, 
that kind of upset a lot of management historians within our field because <laughs> thought, they took that as, as saying that, well, kind of trashing their approach to history maybe, but also claiming that this is the better history of management. But we're kind of very careful not to say that. So, you know, the title was A New History of Management, not the New History of Management, not a better history but replaces theirs. But it's it's the provocation, I guess, was to get people thinking, as you say, but to, to open up, try and open up this field of knowledge and to invite new people in to, to go looking in different places at different times for different ideas about management. Coming back to the comment that we had in the feed about the mainstream narrowing to a trickle, because there's a debate in the field of management, where are the genuinely new management ideas? And if we keep going back to scientific management or the stuff, you know, what was happening 100, 100 years ago in the United States and the United Kingdom, we we're unlikely to find these new ideas. So yeah, it, it was a uh, it was a provocative title, but the criticism of that book, it's by four white um, middle-aged men. So <laughs> that um, is a source of embarrassment for Steve and myself and probably the other two authors. Steve's actually presenting today in, in Birmingham, University of Birmingham in the UK, I think, on exactly this point. Um, so his, his kind of work is going in a different direction, looking at uh, Indigenous ideas about managing and that I, I would I would like to hop in there a little bit um, yeah sure you, so, so there's two things that that one the title of this episode is not a we, we don't need a new history singular of management yeah we all of us need new histories which which imply different perspectives different sources what is what are the histories that we don't know we don't know and and you mentioned that I think also in the um, in, uh, again in the one the chapters of the book about that this collective management again collectivism is such a such a very valent word but in in the non-western cultures in your research and in your readings what insights had you found about say the the customs uh, customs in the pacific islands and and those areas that have brought new insights into management that would be one of those new histories well yeah i mean i've been i've kind of been quite careful here because I've I've come to the conclusion this is a bit of a dodge to your question but it's it's I'm not best positioned to do that work so what I mean what I've so Steve is getting into this and with colleagues here um, and elsewhere around the world he is actually much more embracing indigenous knowledge and perspectives and 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 that's great so you know in New Zealand we have the, the indigenous people here the Maori people and you know, they they are collective and they have different ways of thinking about business and the connection to the land is very deep and strong and um so yeah that's trying you know there are we're trying to create a space for those ideas to and they are more broadly being kind of discussed debated and understood and i i kind of decided not to focus there i'm i mean it's a bit negative in a way but i'm i'm trying to take down these these best-selling management <laughs> textbooks piece by piece yes every Lewin and taylor and uh, maslow yeah. and not putting in milgram i'm trying in effect to i can't, i guess i'm trying to kind of get people to question their credibility because if if, if we conclude that you know these oh sorry i've got my blind i might just pop my blind down <laughs> Um, that's that's, the, that's the management gods shining a light on you saying ha ha yeah enlightened yeah um you know if we can if we can challenge the, the veracity of those books then again that kind of opens management up to be something else and other people can come in and provide the ideas so i guess my mm. answer to your question is i'm i'm not i wouldn't consider myself expert in different ideas from different places but hopefully i've at least played a small part in being able to open up a space for yeah. those researchers who, yeah. who are connected to those communities to to share that knowledge yeah, yeah and, and that's if if you take the position that that the business organization is a sort is a force for social change which i think that's that's a, a foundational belief i think um, you know and i share i think in a certain way um but that to do good in the world, to you do good in um, in the world of business, and and that uh, again, you think to partner with folks who don't look sound or have come from the same place in the world as us, and to acknowledge that their wisdom adds to our wisdom. We don't we don't have to take away, but you know there can be a time of of deference to say, 
I want to understand um, how you have come to view working with people together um, mm. in gift economies or other kinds of economies that not that we have to flip the entire Western system of industrialist culture, but to acknowledge that as a species, there are many different ways we can come together and exchange value. And that's, I think, is from what we're saying, you open the space to allow additional voices. And we're like this, these yeah. bricks of history that there's, there are chinks in there. There's, there's mortar missing. And that if you're by the critique, we fill in the mortar and we see much more fully Maslow. Adam Smith was like, that's the first chapter you go into about, about this whole foundational, um, the capitalist Adam Smith, but there was, there was more, there's more than meets the eye and yeah, just as there right. are with cultural and, and these, and these thinkers as well. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying That's exactly what, what you're saying is what I'm trying to do with my students kind of try to teach them some of these foundational theories, teach some about the way they've been misrepresented, get them to understand the politics of management ideas, but then say, so that's the starting point, but I want you to bring in your thoughts and experience of organizations from your cultural backgrounds or from organizations you've worked and to just to say that your experience and you know is really valuable and I want to learn something from you rather than me being the source of knowledge and getting you to give back what I've given you. So it's you know, and not all students are up for that because some a lot of students are very intimidated by that. You know, it's like just sure. tell me what I need to know. Um but the test. for those for those students that are up for it. It, it can be quite a liberating experience. It's like, wow, this this class, you know, the lecturer really cares about what I think and I'm being encouraged to think in creative ways and I can learn from my own experience of family life and, you know, countries outside of New Zealand where I grew up. And I don't know, I think that's, for me, that's what, we should have more of that in education, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. I certainly think that your work of pinching the, debunking the myths and, uh, you know, um, in deflating the the authoritarian narratives the ideolo ideologic uh, yeah i know. use it yeah I, I use that kind of it is very uh, it's very political dogmatic ideological in a way that we usually are not aware of and uh, yeah i mean my experience of being in the politics department was also ideological because that was that's where i feel sure. this real disconnect because in the business school, I thought I had I was being socialized to be a kind of free market capitalist. But at the same time, in the politics department at Auckland <laughs> University, I was being socialized to be this kind of left wing radical. Yeah. And that's and I'm, I'm being this at the same time. I'm thinking, well, does anyone actually care what I think here or to, to, to get the high grades? Do I just have to play the, the role in each faculty? And I just yeah. I didn't like it. But I did it because yeah. I was so obsessed with getting the grades. That's a sad thing. And I've talked to lots of students who have similar experiences because, you know, we're very kind of performance based. Some people performing well at university is very important to their identity and important to their families. And I, I was really hung up about that as well in, in a really unhealthy way. I had this un unhealthy obsession with getting these top grades. So I would just do what I would just tell lecturers what they wanted to hear, basically. You said something in um, one of the chapters about the um, the that the insecure achiever is uh, is is valued that oh oh if you if you have the sense of insecurity about yourself we can manipulate that yeah. performance out of you which I think is another thing is that oh my gosh I have to get the grade I have to I have to do this or I'm not gonna I'm not gonna jump over the hoop or the yeah uh, and. Uh... I, I I resonate with that because I identify that so strongly. Like that was absolutely me growing up, I, insecure overachiever, like wanting to make my particularly my parents so proud, and that because they really my mum particularly was so proud of my academic success, and I I made myself so unhappy by by working myself into the ground, and I had to get these A grades or else I had failed, and and it annoyed me that getting these A grades made was to do that, I had to conform to, I had to tell them what they wanted, that what they believed. That, um, and yeah, that annoyed me. But that's such a driver, both in universities, but professional services firms, you know, Laura Empson, it makes a very strong argument based on thousands of interviews that 
you know, the, the top law firms, accounting firms, they, they are on the lookout for these insecure overachievers because they're incredibly smart, uh, very hardworking. But, you know, she argues the source of that hard work is this need to perform and, and um, you know, that makes them great employees. But then there, there can be a real dark side to that. What happens when we stop performing? Um, and that can be, you know, my colleague Ben Walker has done some amazing research into this kind of what he calls performance-based identity. It's, it's, it's really, you know, it can be this existential crisis if you are no longer seen as a high achiever. And yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's well, you know, if you lose, if you lose your motiv- well, if you lose your motivation, there just add a little touch of surveillance, and then we're all fine. Yeah, that's a, that's good. Eh? And in the little book, I, I like the way you've characterised that because that's partly what we're trying to do because in the mainstream of management, my field organization behavior, it's always this kind of really happy story. You know, organization behavior, human relations as a body of knowledge, it recognized that people are actually people. And if we treat them like people and care about their motivations and lead them well and be attentive to group dynamics, then they will feel great and they will be productive and work work hard for the organization. And absolutely there's an element of that, but there is also this darker side, I think, of, of being watched and judged and, and oh. feeling like we need to be high performers to feel good ourselves. And, and all as I want to say to my students is these are both legitimate ways of thinking about motivation and organization. Um, if you read most organization behavior textbooks, you'll only read that happy story, but we should also explore the dark mm-hmm. side. And then importantly, kind of get them to think about it in relation to their own motivations. What what does it or does not explain about, you know, why they work hard towards particular things? So yeah, there's that, there's that. Hopefully, that element of personal discovery as well as sharing these these theories. You said something earlier, Todd, that I cannot I cannot just get rid of it. Uh, I I have to address it. Um, you said that um, you believe that we will not find the answers to today's business organizational leadership troubles um, with, in the work of people like uh, Frederick Taylor. I found that very interesting. Do, uh, because in your work, in your articles especially, that I have read and reread quite often, yeah. some of them, um, I sometimes wonder, okay, now they they bring you, you guys, uh, if, I, if I may generalize a little bit, you guys, yeah. you and Stephen Cummings, you yeah. always bring the point home. Nobody can miss it, you know? You you, you 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 rub it in. You marinate us in this inside, and you cannot escape. It's like it's it's terrifying sometimes. <laughs> I mean, it's a real learning experience. It's 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 you know very didactic in the way you approach these things. Some people might say, "Oh, these articles are way too long." I had these discussions with other readers when we discussed the yeah. articles. Yeah, uh, I do not think so. I think I always say every word here is is a crucifixation of our prejudices and so on. You know, it's necessary to. Yeah, I mean they are long, but that's just the academic way. Eh? I find most so many academic articles are boring to boring to read. But because I was this journalist background, I've always been encouraged to write in a way that people will not just understand it, but want to read it. You know, actually be yeah. Yeah. connected but to what you're writing. In your, in your work, you usually peel off the bogus and the bullshit and the preconceptions and the misunderstandings and the continued misunderstandings and and. And then what, what, what's left? And I sometimes get, especially reading your, your work, um, this, this one is an ex- just an example. It made me think of that as well. Yeah. Do, do we not find all the answers? In fact, with those people, do we not, do, does, didn't Frederick Taylor in a way know it all? And Mary Parker Follett and, 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 and Kurt Levine and Abraham Maslow, didn't they have pretty much all the answers or Frederick Hertzberg or whoever you might come up with who, who has been mm. who, people who have to be debunked or readers re, re, come to yeah. very interesting recently the, the other day i thought about you and i thought why is why is everybody omitting w edwards deming in academia nobody no academia relates to w edwards deming it's well yeah because i was reading that, i was reading that linkedin article you sent me the other day where you're talking about deming and i'm thinking mm, i don't really know anything about him nobody in recognizes him. he is he is i he think is people, as... some people do but i wouldn't claim to have any knowledge so yeah that's an interesting story maybe he's that's... like today's follett in a way he's ignored by academia as well very interestingly i think have you so, got a theory so... why that is oh yeah 
<laughs> my theory is that, but it's your theory, really, I think. The uh, business academia. You just get to say his theory now on, on full screen. Oh, yeah, look at that. Nice. Oh, no, no, no. I'm just trying to. It's a, it's a little argument. It's very simple. I think it's our <laughs> argument. About management yeah. studies at a certain point divorced themselves from other fields sociology, systems yeah. theory, psychology, philosophy. So we, the, the field really narrowed. Frozen at the key moment. I oh, know. Ah, uh, is that me or is that Neil? Can you carry on the dimming point, <laughs> Ryan? Or uh, we well, need to take well, that one. Well, he he can certainly um, put his flavor on. Really My flavor on is that. Uh, <laughs> see, now you came back in to save me. We lost okay. you, Niels, for a moment. So. Let me try again. So my personal theory is that after Doug, uh, Douglas McGregor the field of management or business studies or whatever it had to seal itself off from psychology sociology philosophy uh, systems theory and so on it it needed to isolate itself because um otherwise everything uh, people like douglas mcgregor maslow would have sunk in the ship ideologically ideologically they had to seal off the the area so to speak and Deming yeah, I, I, is also a crossing type. He crossed different right. spheres easily. So I see. I don't see it as a ceiling off thing. I think they just repurpose those theorists from other fields for their own agenda. Like they they create a you know. So there there was Maslow in psychology, and then management has created its own Maslow to suit the agenda and the ideology of management. So who, I think they're not sealed off. That they're just yeah they just they create another you know they create another a straw man or, a straw man yeah yeah, yeah. who yeah. would that have or, been? so where does deming from come from what field is he coming from deming came from statistics i mean he he, he right. had a doctor in physics but he came then from statistics and he kind of blended then um statistical work on quality production yeah, quality that's right Yes, with right. business and psychology, very importantly, and so systems right. theory as well. So he blended yeah. those things. It's in impermittable. I mean, so he it's, he is in the field of management because that. Oh yeah. Now I'm thinking back, but yes, it's it's with. So you don't probably his work's not done justice. I guess is what you would argue, right? Or he's 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 never cited, never quoted in academia. I think almost never, of course. Yeah, mm. uh, it's 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 um, but uh, but I wonder about this a uh, straw man theory yeah. that you brought up, Todd, if yeah. because my hypothesis is that Maslow and uh, Hertzberg and McGregor, they I uh, still idealized something like philosophy of management philosophy of organizations. And that was they they brought an end to it. I think the, the doors had to be closed. That's my my hypothesis. Yeah. And if you say love... that, then we yeah. build straw men, who would have been those straw men? Uh, uh, Michael Potter, maybe, or or worse. Other economists. Worse. Interesting question. I, I use McGregor a lot because for me, like I think McGregor is twisted a bit because he comes into the, the textbooks as theory X and Y and a naive, stupid then, guy who didn't do thorough research. That's what yeah, it's like. Yeah, history. there's kind of, you know, these weren't empirically validated. So interesting ideas, but we've got much more sophisticated theories of motivation after McGregor. But Incredible. what I find fascinating with McGregor's work is he's, I would describe it as this kind of critical reflexivity. He says all managerial action is based on theoretical assumptions and this assistance that management is a practical activity means that we don't actually think about the assumptions that we have about organizations and employees so for me it's like yeah as managers we need to think critically and personally and reflexively about assumptions that we make about people we're interacting with because that that influences how we practice management that influences yeah. how we manage and that's that's a pretty cool insight, I think. Oh, yes. Uh, it, I think it's the coolest insight of all, that mm -hmm. our own image of human nature of others mm. changes our worlds individually. Yeah. That's very constructivist thinking, of course. Yeah. So yeah. so whoever in our organization believes in theory, that theory X people exists will fuck it up and will yeah. us 
will will will, yeah. will slowly deter the, or punish the organization into command and control mode. With yeah. that, that the, the McGregor insight, I think it's foundation, the foundational insight, really. Very mm. fascinating. Mm. And, and totally ignored. I mean, it, uh, but Maslow, he was, they were closer than most of us think. Uh, I, I've been researching that a little bit over, over time. Yeah, I mean, our Maslow paper, well, you know, kind of, we argue that Maslow didn't create this famous pyramid of human of needs. He had, he had a hierarchy, but he didn't represent it as a pyramid. And it was interesting tracing that story through. So like who created the pyramid and how did that happen? But Douglas McGregor was the key well, he was a linchpin there. He didn't create the pyramid, but he brings Maslow into the work of management studies, I think. And, yes. And kind of, had this kind of, and fascination yeah, kind of um, simplifies Maslow. And off, and many of the critiques that textbooks make of Maslow uh, were actually critiques of McGregor's interpretation of Maslow's theory. Um, but going back to your point about Niels about that, they don't they have all the answers? I mean, that's been what I share with my students is, or encourage them as well, is to read some of the work in the original. Like if you go back and read Maslow's it's 1943 good, article, yeah, it's not like these boring, dry academic articles of today. Eh? You know, this this is just written in a way that you can understand it. And um, yeah, I think in, in many ways, we actually haven't progressed as a field. You know, we've got, you know, much more scientific and, uh, rigorous or whatever you want to call it but in terms of ideas and the way we express ideas about organizations and managing i think we've actually yeah probably headed down the wrong path for the last 50 years yes mm. i think without remarrying management and philosophy and sociology and and psychology you will always critical management management studies will always remain the minority opinion or the, the small yeah. voice in a in a choir of hate and anger and despair you know uh, i think no. i think we're doomed if we if we do not reopen cannot reopen the field and i think your contributions have been invaluable really. uh, starting with the levine article and also this is brilliant i mean uh, all of it is all of your stuff is yeah brilliant. i mean that, the book there about the conservation movement it's about frederick taylor but it, it's one of the the takings from that is the whole context in which Taylor's work came to be popularized, the whole, you know, way that scientific management became so influential, emerged out of this political conservation movement at the start of the 20th century. And, you know, we argue that Taylor it was Louis Brand Lewis Brandeis that actually took Taylor's work, which wasn't get much of an airing, and used it within this broader political movement of, of the conservation movement, and that kind of gave gave it wings. But yeah, that's another thing we try and challenge. Well, we want to understand the context in which ideas emerge, the broader political, socio-economic, yes. cultural context. Yes. And often when you read about these ideas now, that context is stripped away. And because this, the first histories of management were written in the middle part of the um, 20, uh, 20th century, you know, in the 90s and 50s, what were they concerned? They were concerned about efficiency. And so when and they were writing- they were anti-communist, suspicious of yeah. everything, you know. So. so when they're writing about Frederick Taylor and the birth of scientific management, they're writing it through their own values and worldview and prejudices. And so, and, we're, and we still learn that history today. Whereas if we went back and explored the conservation movement, and the emergence of scientific management, then we can see that this concern with sustainability is not a new thing. It was front of mind for those for those people a century ago when they're thinking how we how can we use resources in a more sustainable way. Or back into the 18th century to the work of Adam Smith before Wealth of Nations about the morality. Uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. And that's that's not a new idea that we've promoted. I mean, I remember being talked about this at, when I was a student, actually, by one of my more enlightened lecturers. But yeah, the whole kind of narrowing of the gaze on Adam Smith's work just on the wealth of nations, and you know, this idea of the invisible hand and laissez-faire. And, and sure, there's there's elements of that in his, in his writing, but the, but but you really need to position that against other other things that he was writing about. Yeah, and so the way that he's been used to justify particular views of economics and management, I don't think really does does service to his broader body of work. 
Yeah. That is a topic you write about in the small book, in the little book? A little bit, yes, yep. Yeah. And we've written about Smith separately yeah. Yeah, yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and it's kind of just, you know, just along the same general idea about getting us to question these foundational theories or people and what do we really know about? Do we really know much about them? Have we really... Yeah. written any of their their actual work or I do you know it's that's just a retelling a retelling that gets further away from from where what they were what they were primarily concerned about but it's a deliberate retelling I think and this is where it connects back to this ideological point I think it's very purposeful retelling because there's a deliberate twisting to validate the views of the field whoever's in power in that field, whether it's economics yeah. or management, or whatever, you know, we can use these famous figures to say, ah, we are real, we are a real academic enterprise because we've got Kurt Levine or Adam Smith, but actually we're, we're twisting them in a way that just promotes, you know, the values we want to promote. Yes. It's not, it's not a good move. And, and then again, I, I, there are two questions that came. One, I think I'll start with is about then Milton Friedman, comes into the situation mm -hmm. and that there's 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 such a a worship of freeman uh, um, in many ways and uh, and that the system is i think you you paint a different side of that as well so mm -hmm. i I'd, I'd like you to to talk about the, yeah. the the more recent economists there yeah so this is the work this is just a little kind of you know I don't know if you find this, but because we're learning all the time, sometimes I'm a bit scared about putting something out there when I haven't really fully investigated it. And, mm -hmm. and the mention of Friedman in this book is a little bit like that, because I'm interested in, because within minute, you know, Milton Friedman is a hero of a certain brand of economic thought, Chicago school and things. So he's a hero there, but in management texts and management studies, he is the bad guy because mm -hmm. What we learn about Milton Friedman and management textbooks is that when he writes this New York Times article in 1970, he's saying the social responsibility of business is to maximize profit. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that's that's the stockholder view or the shareholder view. And, and students are told in modern management textbooks, that's a bad idea because we have the stakeholder view. And that's saying it's not just about shareholders, it's about everyone that has a stake in the business. It's about customers as suppliers it's about the environment it's about local communities and so freeman is the bad freeman is the bad guy and stakeholder theory is they're the good guys and it's confusing because the stakeholder the theorist is edward freeman so his name is really similar to milton friedman so friedman is the bad guy freeman is the good guy but if you read freeman's work I would position Friedman and Freeman as very close together on a, on a broad spectrum. They're really close. They they share most of the same thing. So if you read Freeman's original work, he's he's writing a book about strategy because today you know he gets written up as this ethical you know business ethical business stakeholder approach. He's writing about strategy. He's writing about how can we make more money. And he, he's just making the argument, you make more money if you care for communities and the environment and et cetera. Whereas if you are just perceived as this narrow profit maximizer, then that's that's not a good look today. So, but in a sense, he's still very similar to Freeman. He doesn't like government intervention. He believes in the free market. He doesn't particularly like unions from what I can see. Um, so, you know, I, I want to kind of explore how Friedman is the bad guy. Freeman's the good guy, and and I think they, they are similar in a lot in a lot of ways. They're, but they're both, they're both human beings. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen our paper on the where we try to to push the um, our thinking about Mary Parker Follett in a slightly different direction than you do in your book? Did you see that we 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 believe? Well, I believe, at least, I should speak for myself and Silke, yep. we believe that there is something like a Follettian school and that this idea of balancing stakeholder interests goes way back. Right. 
maybe one of the pioneers, or probably one of the pioneers in management thinking, who brought this to management thinking, would be Mary Parker Follett. Maybe mm. even, and this was very confusing for me, Ruth Randa has also had these ideas. We, uh, we cannot know, maybe, or I, I, I'm not yeah. quite sure. Mm. Maybe it would be good to go to the original sources as well on that, you know. Yeah. Just like philosophers, yeah. right? They have to read the original stuff instead of reading textbooks. Right, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. We should, right? But we hypothesize that this idea has a, there's a strand of thinking, um, 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 a minority of thinkers, but significant, very significant thinkers, even partially people like Henry Mintzberg would be probably be in it as well. Uh, and I would place Peter Drucker Deming, of course, and, and mm -hmm. Chris Argeris and so on uh, in this strand of thinking. And so, yeah, it's probably, there have been competing schools, we argue in this, in this in this a his another yeah that's it i trying to spin i mean it's and, lots of competing schools different perspectives but there's all i mean it's there's always a incentive i guess to to push your own way of thinking a sure. and sometimes i feel there's a not enough about in academia i mean know about academia sometimes i feel there's academic fields that are really have strong parallels to each other but it's, you could make this argument out about critical management studies. It's kind of there are career benefits from grabbing onto a tribe and staying staying with that tribe, and then you position your tribe against the other tribe and say, no, they've got it wrong and we've got it right. And in some way, that's that's a way of teasing out knowledge. But sometimes you think that yeah, if we were a bit just a bit more open to to other ways of thinking, then we could have more interesting conversations rather than so much trying to prove that you know our idea is the best. I don't know. Well, you know, if if the uh, educational establishment were more Follettian, seeking integration and right. unity instead of uniformity, maybe, maybe we might be. Right. Um, yeah, well, I need to work. I know you've done the work on Follett, but I need to go back. I mean, it's on my to-do list once we are revising this for the second edition. Yeah, to to actually get a bit more educated on that stuff. We are looking forward to that new edition, sure, for surely, and we shall promote it as well. Yeah, yeah good. Thank you. I have one more. Maybe, maybe this takes us into the future. You know, we need new histories. And now how do we, in today, what history are we creating today? Who are the, are these pillars of, of what we will call history, you know, down the road? You know, uh, Niels and I, we, in one of our uh, uh, beta codex uh, roundtables, we talked about Maria, uh, Mariana Mazzucato. And a couple right. of her books around that, and that this this mission economy, this a very different way, or, or uh, I don't know, maybe it's a different way of of marrying the governmental regulatory governance structure in partnership, not like the traditional business uh, community partnership, but something more, oh God, more humane, more more generative. So. If mm. I don't know if you want to say something about Mazzucato, or if there are other thinkers that that you're seeing um, pushing yeah, the envelope, that's, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not. I wouldn't call myself at all up to with contemporary thinkers. I'm, I'm buried still in in the old stuff. But I, what present I guess company what I, excluded? Okay, right. Yeah, present yeah, company. yeah. I'm, I'm. I mean, what I do find interesting is that it's hard to predict now because history is history will be written in a future time about the concerns of the future. And we don't actually know what their concerns will be. So I think it's very hard to predict in say 30 years, who they will look back to today in order to write their histories, right? And even how they will write those histories because they will be writing for their present time. And yeah, that's one of the first, you know, this distinction between the past and history. Our access to the past is only through history History is written in the present. History is written by people with authority and influence. And it's very hard to foretell who those people will be, what their concerns will be, and therefore what they will choose from today. And it might and how they will present that or misrepresent that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I can say that I'm currently reading a book of one of your uh, former co-authors, Mats Alveson. Uh, right, so, yeah. Uh, um, he's he's uh, he's just like yeah he's a, a titan of the field of critical management studies he's yes just, um mm -hmm. mass, he's written so much for so many years and had so many influence i'm so, currently yeah. reading the triumph of emptiness and even the right. first just the first uh, first pages are 
so crisp, so to the point, so critical, so uh, brilliant, brilliant stuff, I can say. Yeah. You, yeah. I'm easy. impressed with your re your reading interests and your your depth <laughs> of reading, Niels. It's it's impressive. I wish I read as much. I, <laughs> I think you do. I think you do. From from what I see in your in your work, you you read quite a bit. But I think we have to. This, this is something that I find more and more important. Uh, now that I'm over 50 years old. So thank you, by the way, for your message, together with yeah. Stephen, that you produced for my 50th birthday a couple of years ago. Yeah. It yeah. was just, it made my day. For, for making the connection there. Yeah. <laughs> that was just yeah. fantastic. And uh, yeah, something that with age, I have learned to appreciate. It's, it's, it might be obvious, but I think we have to be more widely read. We have to read beyond our field to understand mm. our field. We need to understand history. And philosophy and psychology uh, we we need to study those things otherwise we we will just repeat the bland prejudices and the misunderstandings and, and yeah keep... that's why i don't that, i'd agree and i that's why yeah. i don't like this kind of is it presentism or this idea that you know we are at the moment at the high point of development and we are more <laughs> progressed than anyone and more advanced yeah. with better ideas you know that because yeah. it's this this history of this kind of belief in progress, eh? And and I the problem with that way of thinking is that we can be a bit arrogant and think we've got the answers. Whereas, yeah, we need to look both back, I, but I guess to other outside of ourselves, eh, to be able to then reflect back on what we think. So I, I'd agree, I'd agree with you there. Yeah. By the way, two texts that impressed me recently. Uh, I, I read a, a piece by Ed, W. Edwards Deming about education and teaching. Right. And he says, yeah. The, the person who doesn't research shall not teach because mm. the person who doesn't research has nothing to teach. Yeah, Fantastic article, just two, two pages. <laughs> and another thing that uh, you, you must have, you probably have read all of it, uh, that Maslow book, Maslow on Management, edited yep. in only in the 90s, yep. but, you know, yep. a collection of articles by Abraham Maslow. We, it had a different titles title when it was originally published. I think but, those yeah. articles are so wise, so yeah. well uh, well articulated those ideas that a psychologist had on organizations, I think. So brilliant yeah. that all the answers are there. We just have to look differently at it and reread it and, and, and work more with the original sources instead of reading all those yeah. textbooks. Yeah, you've got me interested in dimming. I'm going to go back and have a look. Yeah, have a look yeah. I'm yeah. also willing to send you, if you like, of W. Edward Stemming. What would Deming do? It's the shortest way to, right. to, to start, start. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. And it's original quotes by W. Edward Stemming, so uh, you might like that. It's hilarious. Right. Every student can read it. It's, it's really Good. hilarious, brilliant, and profound. Yes. What else? What, what else would you like to address, Todd? There is nothing else I need to address. Thank you for your interest and time. It's a great privilege always to this be able to talk so about beautiful. my work. This was yeah, so beautiful. Really your is. work is so beautiful, and yeah. we will have to keep keep. Uh, what What are you working on right now? It's that, not the new edition. The articles or topics? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's I've got, you know I'm. It's weird because I'm the head of school of management, say, so I'm kind of a man. You know, I'm <laughs> largely manager. manager, a little bit of teacher and a little bit of researcher, but. I'm yeah. hopefully going to go on my sabbatical for a year next year, and that will be a, a chance to reinvigorate myself into the research thing. So, yeah, I've got a couple of ideas. Like this Freeman Friedman one I'd like to pursue. Um, but, yeah. yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, kind of time to take stock and think about where I'd like to go and who I'd like to work with and things. I mean, I'm working with student, Brazilian PhD student who's interested in the representation of race and ethnicity. In, in kind of management textbooks. So that's that's an ongoing project. But yeah, I, I think I'll st still keep within this line of research. Eh? It's like, because I, I stumbled around for 10, 15 years not knowing what to do. And it's it's been really good to just to be able to focus on one area. And I think there is something to say there and there's still good work to be done. And yes. so I think I'm just gonna keep doing that. And yeah, I reckon. Please do so because, in my personal, very personal opinion, it's, it's maybe the most important research in management that's being done today. It's uh, oh, fabulous. Nice. And, and, I need and you on so, my uh, so liberating. Yeah. 
Yes. Great. Thank you very much. This was delightful. We might we might get in touch with your colleague Stephen as well. Yeah, he would be good to chat to, eh? You know, particularly about your your question, Ryan, about yeah, ideas coming from from different Other places, cultures, particularly yeah. in indigenous cultures. Yeah, he would be way better able to speak to that. Yes, mm. if we can, if we can get him on the phone or on the internet, if he's if he's living with indigenous cultures right now, so will it be hard to yes. get in touch with? Him? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think he's in, an, in I think he's in Birmingham, which uh, so oh. yeah, that's that's a long way from so a long way from home. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Todd. This was delightful. Right. Final words. Uh, final words. It's just so wonderful to get um, a fuller view of what we thought was you know this history to see to see history with new eyes and better eyes you know more complete i think that's wonderful and i love it all right well i'm going to go and say good night gracie to those of you out there in the betaverse whenever and however you are thank you for the precious gift of your time and attention i'm ryan erickson for beta codex live we shall see you <laughs>